Um, so basically, um, in a game like ours, an online action RPG, um, one of the things that players are going to be doing is um, playing through the same content um, again and again um, as they try out different characters and builds, and classes and items and that kind of thing. Um, so one of the things we really needed to do was um, have a random level system so that um, when uh, coming through the second time, the monsters aren't all standing in exactly the same places and um, all the features are kind of rearranged in a way that um, makes it um, more interesting. So um, uh, with a game like this though, we don't really want to have like a completely uh, random system uh, where anything could kind of happen because we need to make sure that all the objectives are in place, like this waterfall is always going to be in this level for example, and if you walk around a little bit more these, um, you know, like this level has, you know, trees and that kind of thing. These uh, things will always be around, you might want to turn monster AI off. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, we've got a lot of constraints that we need to apply, um, but... Uh, <laughs> okay, anyway. uh, so basically, um, as you can see, the world um, is made out of tiles. So if you go down to the... Uh, the uh, oh, there's there. um, so here's an example of a bunch of tiles that um, make up the, uh, uh, one of, the, one of the, our dungeons called um, the prison. Uh, so if you flip through all of the different uh, sets there, as you can see, just the prison alone has um, quite a large variety of different tiles um, that can, uh, can be used. And um, I guess the first thing uh, to learn about sort of a tile-based system is that we need to have some way of, um, you know, for the artist to make these um, and then for them to mark them up so that um, the game engine knows where all the different connection points are. Um, so for example, if we look at this piece of wall here, um, you'll see that uh, it's got like sort of two uh, arrows coming up, and those represent uh, places where um, the engine knows that um, there is a connection that could be made to other tiles. And when the artists are making these, um, they have to realize that the tile can be flipped, uh, you know, rotated up four times, and then there's also a flip, and then the rotations of that. So that means that um, when they're making them, they have to be very careful that um, if they, this tile here, given any flip and rotation, could connect up to uh, any one of the other tiles in the scene. Um, and uh, so, I mean, there's also, of course, the other thing that um, we want to have more, so we want to have a lot of variety of tiles. So, for example, there are multiple uh, straight wall segments. I don't happen to see any others in the scene. Oh, they don't show them. Yeah, they don't show, yeah, they don't show them. Um, which leads me to the second thing, which is that um, whenever we reference tiles, we, ne we never talk about a specific tile by file name. What we do instead is we store the connections, and then we use the layout of connections to um, refer to them. So whenever you want to say, okay, I want like a, a straight wall segment like that, um, it doesn't just ha we don't just pick a specific one. Uh, we pick from any one in a giant list of them. Um, so uh, moving on, um, we have more than one type of level generator in Path of Exile. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is uh, room-based generators. So room-based generators are um, a very, very common method of um, generating uh, levels, uh, which I believe will just uh, show you a level as generated by room generator now. Um, uh, that's not important. Um, so um, yeah, he's just going to show you a, um, a, a, a dungeon called the prison, uh, as, as we saw the tiles for that earlier. So here's an example of a room-based generated dungeon. Um, and as you can see, it's made of um, lots of sort of square rooms. Now, if you go to the room editor for a second, um, and go to, to the, yeah, yeah. So this is an example of a room that was pre-constructed by an artist. So they have all of these various tiles, and they can place the wall tiles down in a prefabricated way, um, place down places where chests could go, where um, uh, decals can go, and like, you know, monsters and that kind of thing into one of these levels. And then you'll see around the edge of the um, level um, are all of these green uh, points here. Now these are points where doors could potentially go. Um, and in this particular case, a door could go anywhere around the room, but many rooms are restricted as to where the doors could go. So, um, you know, things can be placed next to this and attached to them, um, which, uh, you know, allows us to make a dungeon out of them. Um, so, going back to the actual dungeon that we saw generated, um, I guess the next question we would have is, um, how do we actually place the rooms? Um, so, we need to have control. So, going to the graph, uh, we have this thing called the graph editor, uh, which allows us to uh, construct uh, uh, like a layout for a dungeon. Now this may not look like a dungeon, uh, <laughs> but uh, in reality, um, uh, th this sort of defines the basic layout. So as you see here, we've got the first node, um, which has uh, got the room type entrance down. So what that's basically saying is there will be a room um, on this side of the level uh, that can be picked from a set of rooms that are called entrance down. And then we, uh, the dungeon will progress until we get to the center part here, um, which is a boss room. So there'll be a boss somewhere in the level and um, you'll reach it from, you know, from going from there. And then last of all, uh, we have a, uh, the exit out, um, which is another room that can be picked. Um, so basically, um, this, a dungeon will always be, uh, be completable um, via some sequence of rooms that goes from, you know, along that path. 
Um, and that's basically that. Now they can get more complicated, right? Like you have more different bits coming from the side with like a chest room maybe that has some special thing that drops or whatever. Um, although in this case we just we're leaving it simple. Um, so uh, sorry, what was the next point? Um, right, so uh, can you bring up the diagrams um, of how so basically um, I just want to talk for a bit about how we actually do this. Um, so basically what we for each one of those lines, we're basically going to start with a room at the beginning and a room at the end that are pre-placed into the level. Um, we pick them in advance and we plonk them down. Um, and the next thing we want to do is we want to somehow generate a sequence of rooms from here to there that is going to sort of feel natural, be a bit maze-like, um, but won't be too insane and um, you know, like, uh, has certain controllable properties. Um, so the, way that we, uh, the, the problem that you can run into though is that um, a lot of naive algorithms, um, you can start placing down rooms and then block yourself off and prevent yourself from getting anywhere, uh, which is a big problem. So we need to have something that always succeeds. So we came up with this algorithm uh, that uses the, uh, uses the shortest path algorithm, so we'll just show you that now. So the first thing we do is we divide the, uh, the level up into uh, pre-sized uh, um, areas, which are the same size as the rooms that we have available. And then we color each of these, um, well not really color them, but we give each one of them a weighting. Um, so if you imagine a red room as a room that's very hard to get through, um, and the green rooms are um, very easy to get through, and you can imagine if you were to look at the shortest path from the start to the end through all the easy rooms, that's what you would get. Um, then if you take that set of rooms um, and you put doors between all of them, this here is going to be the start of our dungeon layout that's completable that goes from start to end and we pick a bunch of uh, rooms to go in there. But to make it more interesting, we want to have some sort of maziness. So you have this thing called the branching factor, um, which is where we add in a bunch of rooms that attach to the rooms that make up the primary sequence um, to make a dungeon that looks like that. Um, so there you go, there's all of the, um, the sizes and door configurations for all of the rooms that we have. Um, and uh, then we can just take a look at the set of rooms that we have and place each one of them inside one of these um, uh, squares. Um, and of course we can flip and rotate them and stuff so they don't seem the same. And of course we also have the fact that um, the, uh, because we use tile keys for everything, the rooms always look a bit different as well. Uh, and of course we make very larger numbers of them. Uh, you know, they're handmade by artists, there's lots. Um, so that's basically the basics of room-based uh, generation. Now I'm just going to show you a few screenshots um, of, uh, just quickly, of um, different types of dungeons that this could generate. So I mean, here's like a sort of, uh, what is that thing, a cave? I can see up the top left there. Um, this, this here is the church dungeon. Now, many of these look very similar because obviously from a high level view, you know, obviously dungeons look kind of similar. But um, now it's very good for sort of indoor levels um, and even a sort of cave thing here. Um, uh, if you keep going through them. Um, but what it's not so good at is um, sort of outdoor organic shapes and um, things like that. So um, in order to do that kind of thing, we wanted to have a different system um, for doing outdoor levels, uh, which we can now show you. Uh, what was the next thing? Um, yeah, so now for, the out, for our outdoor level generator, we wanted to have the same uh, overall goal of making the levels predictable uh, to create um, and sort of have a lot of control over what was going to be in them but obviously be uh, different every time. Um, so in order to do that, we um, came up with an, another system that we're using this graph head editor here for. And what we're going to do is we're going to place down a, um, a line here, and this line is going to represent a road. So unlike the dungeon level, this one kind of more directly maps onto the actual level that you're creating. Um, so, so that's not a road, that's a, a wall, uh, rather. So uh, Reese places down this, uh, this wall, and then what we're going to do is we're going to show you how that turns into a level that actually is created. Uh, which I assume we do now. So as you see, um, the uh, <coughs> generator has created a, uh, a wall that goes from one side of the level to the other, and the actual path that that wall takes is random if you click uh, a few more times. Uh, sorry, you forget. Uh, yeah, just to, uh, maybe we just go straight to this. Oh, there you go, there's another one. Uh, <laughs> you, you get the idea. Uh, anyway, so um, as you can see, it sort of randomized the, um, the, the, uh, the topology of the level um, to come up with uh, where the wall's going to go. So if we actually go back to the... Um, now, so we have a visualization that we use for debugging the system. Um, it allows us to see step by step what the generator is doing as it's going through this process. So you can see we start off with our line. Um, we have a... Uh, that's what we call macro node permutation, where it's picked at random places for the nodes to go. Um, and then next up we have this thing called macro edge permutation. Now what's going on here is it's actually a very similar algorithm to the room layout one that we talked about earlier, where we divide the level up into segments and we give each one a random weighting, um, and then we take the shortest path from A to B. And that causes this nice sort of organic shape here, and then after a few more steps, um, which have not really done much now, then we do this sort of tileization process, where we take the, uh, the tiles that um, we have and we um, uh, ass assign them along this path. Um, so I should talk about connection points, because I haven't talked about the 
Um, so in order to get a line that's like fluid enough in that uh, situation, um, do you have the room editor with the, um, not, not this one, the, uh, go to the room editor with the uh, forest part, actually. So in order to get a line that has that sort of um, fluidity, uh, we had to revisit our tile system. So rather than having just um, connection points, one per edge, we decided to move to a system where um, we actually have three possible connection points per edge. Um, so as you can see, there's the top and the bottom and the middle here. Um, and each of these, um, a tile has to be created for each of the um, uh, different possible permutations. Now, of course, there's rotations and flips. So you actually need about 10 tiles to make the set. Plus, if you want to have joins, like there's a thing that connects three and a thing that connects four, um, then that gives you um, uh, the ability to create more shapes. Uh, in addition to this type of thing, we also have a, um, can you find the, uh, the wall, uh, sorry, the, the cliff? Um, so in addition to that though, there's also um, things that are like cliffs. Um, now a wall has obviously uh, two sides that are identical, but um, something like a cliff, uh, something like a cliff, um, as you see, has a you know a high and a low side. So in order to make all the different permutations you need to make a smooth connection between all the different cliff shapes, um, you need to uh, have uh, what is it, 16? 18. 18, 18 16. different uh, c connections, and that that'll make up the set. Um, so going back to our wall example, um, as you can see, um, we've made our um, you know a line across the map. And in order to create that, if you go to the image um, of the Bezier curve, we turn the line that we've got into a Bezier curve, and then we just match the um, you know the, the, the closest points between the Bezier curve and the connection points, and then we use that as our tile key that we then look up one of the tiles that we have, and there you go, there's your tile. Um, so that's like um, that process basically there. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add another um, another line. Um, one of those cliff shapes uh, to, the, to the level. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, because it's a cliff, um, the line has two sides, so Reese has to pick which side the high side is and which side the low side is. So you can see here, um, this is actually a, a wall that blocks the edge of the level, so there's a sort of inside cliff thing on this side in that sector, and then there's, this is just wildcard meaning whatever else on the rest of the level. So if you see what that generates, um, <coughs> uh, then uh, as you see, there's a cliff, and you know, that's pretty obvious. Um, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add a river. Um, so the thing with rivers, um, as you may have noticed about rivers, uh, they actually have two sides. So um, when we're making, um, putting a river into the level, um, we're not really just putting one line. We're putting uh, you know, two lines, one for each side. That means we have to be very careful with what we do. So if you see uh, the level, here's a river you know, in between, and as you can see the topology is preserved. Going into the debug view again, uh, as you can see we've got the three lines. We do the macro node permutation, um, and then we do macro edge permutation first, um, as you see here, and then once we've done that, we do this sort of splitting phase. We split the river in, um, in two along lengthwise along the, um, the normal, and uh, then we get uh, the sort of river shape. There's a bit of rounding in there, and then we do the you know the uh, edge stuff, and then we fill it all in. Um, so now we've got our level of the river. Um, so next up, um, what we haven't had until now are things that cross each other. Uh, so the next thing we're going to add is a road, and what we're going to do is we're going to have it coming from the left here. Uh, go over the river, then through the middle of the wall, and then off the top of the level. Um, now, uh, one of the things we haven't really talked um, about until this point was what the uh, macro uh, node permutation part is really doing. Um, because, I mean, obviously you can't just rearrange nodes everywhere in the level, you have to have some kind of method to your madness. So going back to the, um, the graph editor, um, we use a thing called a, a, um, a Voronoi diagram. So what this is, if we shows it here, is that um, all of the, the level is divided up into cells, um, which correspond to the closest parts to each of the different nodes. And then if you make sure that one of these nodes, uh, if, if you move the node around showing the Voronoi diagram, um, you can see how the Voronoi diagram ch uh, changes uh, as, as, as you move the nodes around. Um, now, if you, what we've realized is, is that so long as you only move one of these nodes within inside one of these Voronoi cells, so long as it doesn't also cross over one of the things that goes through the Voronoi cells, then you're not gonna get the situation where if you move the node up there, um, off the other side. You're not going to get that kind of situation when you're rearranging the nodes, which would be bad due to this cost that we weren't expecting. So um, basically, uh, once we've got that out of them, uh, as you can see, we can move the, uh, the nodes around um, in a reasonably random fashion um, without causing too many problems. So if you go back to the level that we generated and then look at the debug um, stuff again, uh, we're just going to talk about how we actually went about generating this level uh, now that there's a sexual thing. Um, so the first thing we really need to do after the uh, random node generation uh, and of course, there's, uh, is we need to work out um, what are we going to do about all these crossing points. So in this particular case, we've got a road crossing a river. So we've got a special tile here called a bridge um, that we put in here. 
And the way we match that is by using that tile key system once again, where we've matched the virtual edge coming in here, which is what we call the reverbal type, uh, and, 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 and this road coming in here. Um, now, if we look at the other crossings in the graph at the moment, you'll see that um, the one up there, we can't quite do at the moment. And the reason why is we don't have a tile which is road crosses uh, wall. So what we have to do is um, we have to wait until our later stage. So we're first of all, we're going to do the, uh, the macro edge stuff, and then we're going to split the, uh, the you know, do some rounding and split all of the edges apart um, using that process. And you'll notice that the edges connect up to the correct road parts here um, uh, because it sort of knows where they are. And then we're going to look at the nodes up there again. Okay, so this time we do have a tile that can fit there. It's like a road crosses edge, uh, you know, uh, sorry, road edge goes to wall tile. Um, so we throw one in there on each side, and then we continue on doing the generation as we did before. Um, which now we will step through uh, doing all the edges and so on. So um, after the step, uh, after we've filled it in, this is a basic sort of layout of a very simple level that we'll put together um, just on the fly here. Um, and so that sort of defines the gameplay space, but what we don't have is sort of all the niceness that makes it look, you know, like a real level. So we're supposed to be in a forest here, so obviously we've got trees and things like that, so we're just going to add some trees in here um, with the magic button. and. Uh, so now we've got some sort of, um, you know, some sort of extra terrain features. Now the reason why the, there's these black things on top of the trees is because the camera is under that and they just cause shadows um, uh, when you look at them on the level. Um, so you know, as you can see, we've got these little mound things everywhere and um, and trees. Um, so then, of course, um, you know, the ground still looks kind of bland. So the next step is to add lots of materials um, to the level um, to make the ground look nicer. Um, so the algorithm for that is pretty simple. We just uh, do sort of blotchy pattern, and there's also rules about you know things like these mounds here get um, special. Uh, treatment where you know someone's said okay mounds will get this texture on them and that kind of thing. So obviously you know now we're getting a lot sort of nicer ground texture going on there. And then the last uh, lastly we uh, add things called doodads, which are basically just random undergrowth and scrub and branches and crap like that um, that uh, get thrown down there. Um, so as you can see now we have a kind of foresty looking uh, level. I think the doodads are put over the top in this example. Um, and there's other things like grass and stuff that we can throw in there. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean that's basically a walkthrough of um, you know uh, creating a level design from um, start to finish. If you uh, minimise this and go into the game, uh, there's sort of one last touch um, that we like to add, and that's um, being able to control the environment and um, uh, forget about the random static squares there. <laughs> um, so basically, this environment editor, which is hard to see on this low resolution screen, uh, have you got COD mode on, Ruth? He can't, he can't touch you. Okay, cool. So as you can see, we can adjust in real time all the like you know lighting and shadows and that kind of thing. If you minimize the thing again, you'll be able to see it more easily from Shift Four again. Uh, as you can see, we've changed the lighting quite a lot. Um, and uh, if you press, uh, if you can do things like change the color and like you know that kind of stuff. Um, uh, that, that's adding brightness to the to the light. Um, you may as well turn that right up. Go for it. Awesome. Um, pink. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. Uh, the um, Obviously, this looks a bit ridiculous. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, there, there's quite a lot of different things that the artist can change in there, um, like uh, fog, for example, and, um, and, and stuff like that. Um, I wouldn't try to play with that. I used some lightning light. Sure. Uh, anyway, you should probably load the old environment so that it doesn't look like a circus. Um, uh, that one, yeah. Uh, one, sure, yeah. Anyway, there, there's the old environment. Um, anyway, so um, there you go. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's basically the process uh, end to end. Um, if you have any questions for us um, or anything like that, then feel free to ask them. We're happy to talk about a lot of stuff. We'll be talking around for pizza if you want a one-on-one -on -one session. Um, and we are currently in alpha, so um, try to avoid the staticky squares. Reese, they look horrible. <laughs> um, the, um, we're currently in alpha, so um, if anyone's interested um, in actually seriously being a tester, and I don't just mean you're interested in playing the game a little bit, I mean actually you know, coming up to us and doing, giving us proper feedback, then we'd love to have you um, on our, in our alpha group. Um, so yeah, feel free to talk to us about that. And uh, we are potentially hiring more artists to uh, add to the meat grinder of tiles. Um, so you know, if any of you are interested in that, then um, feel free to uh, talk to us and we'll get in contact. Um, thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, sure. When you release this game, are you going to be adding, like, giving all these tools to players? No. <laughs> we're, in, um, we're, we're an online game, um, and like we're only online. We don't have a single player. Um, so that means that um, we can't really uh, kind of do that, right? I mean, so we're providing an online service. Yeah. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. I've got about a million questions. Um, this one was about um, things like the Waterfall, for example. Uh -huh. Do you have special features? 
more interesting than uh, yes, uh, we specified to be in the level. Yes, we definitely do. So um, basically, um, th in that particular case, I believe that tile was one that was specifically picked to go here because it's actually an entrance to the next level. Um, so yeah, that, that's a specific feature. I, 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 um, we can sort of, uh, even though we do that, like um, we can still pick um, from a set from a set of them if we want to make lots. Although in this particular case, we don't really want to make lots of those. <laughs> They're kind of expensive. So um, yeah, yeah, we, we can definitely uh, do that. And um, the other thing as well is that we can put rooms that have been pre-constructed into our outdoor levels at, as if they were a tile, which allows for making like a little scene. Um, yeah, and then putting a preset group of tiles. Right, exactly, yeah, exactly. We can just make a preset group and then just dump them in there as like, you know, if we want like a little boss camp or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the other question was, uh, I'm guessing the answer was Z-axis. Sorry, what was that? Oh, the Z-axis. Um, we have high transitions. Uh, we didn't really show it off there. Um, that cliff that I showed you earlier, that was a, a high transition. Like, we have tiles that allow you to go through them and up and so on. Um, however, um, like, you know, it, it, it's sort of, uh, it's based on levels, right? Like, the, the world is 2D um, in, in the gameplay sense. It's just that um, we have high transitions where you can go up a level and down a level. Um, and you'll see more of, I mean, you can see more of that in the actual game with caves and things like that we use all the time. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, go on. That is a bug that I've only ever seen on Reese's laptop, which is unfortunately the only laptop we had available before this uh, demonstration, uh, which I still have to investigate. Um, I've never seen it on anyone else's machine before, so hopefully that doesn't affect too many of our players, but we still have to fix it. Um, anyone else? Go on. Uh, you mentioned that it's online only game. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, like, a lot of PC games are being online only. Why would you not put in support? Oh, so the reason why that is is because we're, our game is free to play, and so the thing that we're selling are um, cosmetic microtransactions, um, where basically you can um, pay to get like you know make your sword look on fire and that kind of stuff, you know, or like uh, get pets and things like that. So basically, our the only thing we're selling is something you know is something that you um, have to be on our service to be able to get. Um, so that's basically why, like, we're not, a, you know, you, you don't have to pay to play our game. Anyone can play for free, and they get all of the, um, all of the features except for the cosmetic things that we sell, um, as well as a few other utility things, like, you know, potentially between servers and that kind of thing, right? Um, so, I mean, we're definitely an online, um, you know, like, our business model is a free-to-play MMO business model. Um, we're not really a, you know, a single-player game at all. Um, anyone else? Uh, in the back there? Um, I don't, you said this game is 2D. Was there any... Oh, but, but I meant the gameplay is 2D. The gameplay is 2D because yeah. you've got no idea of like 3D terrain. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any thoughts of, well, was there a conscious decision to not have it because of a certain reason? Or? Um, oh, well, I mean, basically it's a lot easier to make so many game systems if you only uh, have a 2D plane. We actually do have a third dimension um, that the game knows about. Like, it's, it's, it's a height field, right? Um, like, uh, tiles have markup, which is height. I mean, it's just not really particularly evident on this particular sort of uh, swampy level uh, in the forest. <laughs> so, um, uh, I mean, if, you, if, if Reese was to go to another level, like uh, the terraces, maybe um, one, one, two, I guess. Um, then you'll see, for example, him going up a high transition pretty quickly. I think. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and the thing is, is that we do actually do do collisions uh, in uh, in this height field for things like fireballs. Like if you fire a fireball and it hits a cliff, um, then uh, it will uh, explode rather than continuing on. Um, there's hopefully a height transition somewhere soon. It's a problem with random level generation, right? Like, <laughs> you can't be sure when you're going to run into it. <laughs> so as, as you can see, there's a, oh, there we go, there's a way up. Um, yeah, so I mean, as you can see, and, and we do, like, if, you, if he fires a fireball, he doesn't have the skill, but if he did, then he can fire a fireball and it would collide properly with the train. So I mean, it's, it's kind of 3D in that sense. It's just that, um, like, you know, it makes it a lot easier to do um, stuff, you know, most of the calculations in the 2D. Yeah. Uh, 